Today on Larry King Now, it's Scandal's Tony Goldwyn. Out of the blue, Shonda Rhimes called me and said, how would you like to play the president of the United States with Kerry Washington? I said, that sounds interesting. <laughs> no matter what the situation is or the scene is, every time you walk into a room, you just have this power, this power, this aura, the way people deal with you. You, know, you bring so much to every scene just because you've got that title. On his new project, The Divide. And then you find out, were they innocent? Were they guilty? Who did what? And we explore all of the gray areas in our justice system. Um, you touch success. At the moment, Larry, I'm really grateful for it. You know, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years, and as you know, you know, you go through dry periods and periods of success, and you go up and down. Plus, the most embarrassing moment on the set of Scandal probably was directing myself in a sex scene, Gary Washington. Uh, and what are you doing? Running around naked what and you... be like, okay, no, but God, God, we gotta go again. It's all next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our special guest, Tony Golan, one of my favorite people, the acclaimed actor, director, producer. He's known for Ghost. The Pelican Brief, Divergent, to Walk on the Moon, and Conviction. He is the executive producer and co-creator of WeTV's first original scripted series, The Divide. That premieres on Wednesday, July 16th at 9 Eastern. He appears as Warren Jeffs in Lifetime's Outlaw Prophet, Warren Jeffs. It's on June 28th at 8 p.m. And this fall, back on your screens as President Fitzgerald Grant in the fourth season of ABC's runaway hit, Scandal, God, you're everywhere. It's ex it's a really exciting time creatively. You know, the I mean, scandal, your rebirth, kind of. As an actor, it kind of you know the second uh, this huge second win that just kind of came out of nowhere. I actually hadn't been acting so much because I'd been so busy directing. Because uh, remember, you did this amazing show when we were uh, releasing Conviction with the Innocence Project, and oh, well, sure. remember, what a you movie! Those exonerates coming in, and and Hillary Swank, and I came. So. Uh, it was right after that I thought, uh, having finished that film, that I'd, um, I just wanted to get back to acting, and I'd just done a play on Broadway. And then out of the blue, Shonda Rhimes called me and said, how would you like to play the president of the United States with Kerry Washington? And I said, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so how did you know her? I knew Kerry. We were kind of, you know, we're both of us sort of political junkies and are quite active in sort of social advocacy. So we had been in Washington together just on political stuff, um, advocating for arts education and um, you know different causes. So we were very friendly. And um, But I had been such a huge fan of Carrie's work. So terrific. Every time I'd see her in a movie, I just thought, I have to work with this actress. And Shonda She's... Rhimes, how did you hook up with her? I met Shonda because I directed the third episode of Grey's Anatomy. And so I did. I directed in the first and second season of Grey's. And, um, we became friendly, and you know, I just a huge admirer of hers. Are you surprised at her success? No, I'm not. Sean doesn't. I mean, she it. owns what Thursday nights, right? Now she owns on ABC. Thursday night, she's yeah. got Grey's, Scandal, and How to Get Away with Murder. Yeah, this new show, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Peter Noah show. So, yeah, no, I'm not surprised. You know, I, Shonda is a brilliant, brilliant woman um, who has a very unique uh, voice uh, as a writer and a, and a producer, and a creator. Um, and it just hits the zeitgeist, you know. And, and, and Shonda also, the thing that's amazing about her is with all of her success, she just keeps growing and changing and, you know, trying to get better, so. Scandal is based on a real woman in Washington. I know her. Yeah, I bet you do. I'm yeah, sure you know she, Judy Smith. Yeah. Judy Smith was everywhere. Yep. I mean, if you had a yeah. problem, you called Judy Smith. That's right. Are you surprised at Scandal's success? Well, yeah. I'm always surprised when I <laughs> something that's successful because we, you know, we, as you know, we pour our hearts into everything we do. And I've been involved in so many projects that I was passionately in love with that for one reason or another just didn't find their audience. So when we made Scandal, we all thought we were part of something very special. And I certainly thought it had the potential to be really commercial and that it was, you know, a really original as well as commercial. but. The way that it became successful was a real surprise. You know, it was the network wasn't quite sure what they had at first, so they weren't really pushing it. And we did fine at the very beginning. Uh, respectable reviews, you know, the ratings were decent, but not amazing. But we had this rabid fan base. 
and through the advent of social media, and we all got on Twitter and worked very hard to find our fans, into the second season, it just exploded on a real grassroots level. Fans said to the network, we love this show. And so then the network thought, wow, we have a, a hit here. And then it became, gets become kind of a sense. What's it like to be a president? Oh, it's, um, <laughs> it's just a, it's a great job without the stress. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you pat it in there after anyone? The people I most studied uh, uh, were Obama and Clinton. Um, very different people. Very different people, but both of whom, you know, I wanted Fitz to be a very contemporary president. Um, obviously, when I read the script and even with his name, there was this sort of Kennedy-esque, you know, vibe about him. Although a but Republican. I, although a Republican, yes, but the most sort of Democratic Republican you'll ever meet. But um, uh, so I, I, but I, the thing that Clinton has that's so extraordinary is this ability to connect with people. The best. And he makes you, you can be in a room of a thousand people and he will make you feel like you're just, he's just talking to you. Um, and when you meet him in person, you feel like you've known him for 10 years. Uh, right. And you think, oh, we're going to go have a beer now, <laughs> you know, but, um, and so I wanted Fitz to have that accessible quality. And then the Obama has a similar down to earthness when you, you know, meet him and, uh, and they're both extraordinary, you know, orators and, um, and the thing about Obama that I, I just found so fascinating is his grace under pressure. You know, he's a real clutch player, obviously, and he has this calm in the storm. And I realized that was the key for me about playing the president is that every second of every day, the pressure is um, monumental. When the phone rings, it's not good news. It's never good news. <laughs> it's not. And it's, everything's life and death. Would so. you like to be president for a day? No. No. No, what, would yeah. be, what would be your first edict? I resign. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can someone else take this in this chair? Yeah. Ghost. Mm -hmm. How did you get that? And were you surprised mm -hmm. at how that took off? I was, up to that point, I'd been a acting for about six years. Um, I'd always worked. I was working a lot in the theater and trying to break into films and TV. I had done a bunch of guest stars in television shows, a couple of tiny parts in movies. But literally couldn't even get auditions for movies at that time. Despite the goal and name and your yeah, grandfather. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't really help. Get you uh, in the door, but that's it. It sort of did. And I think at the beginning of a career, it actually can be a bit of a hindrance because people, it's hard to get people to take you seriously. If from a showbiz family, they're like, yeah, okay. So um, I, uh, I just, you know, you, you push. And my wife, who's a wonderful production designer, uh, and at that time her career was on fire way before mine ever was, uh, she was the production designer of Ghost. And she said, you know, I'd read the script and said, what a great script. And she said, they haven't cast that part, you know, you should get, I, and I couldn't even get an audition. So I just browbeat my agents into getting me in and I got an audition and nothing happened. And about three months later, um, I was doing, rehearsing a play in New York and I got a call from my agent who, at that point I could barely get on the phone myself saying they want to screen test you for this movie Ghost. And I flew out to LA and uh, did an old fashioned screen test and, um, you know, miraculously got the Did part. you find something to like? I guess you have to like whoever you play, right? Mm -hmm. Did you find something to like in him? Well, it's interesting. That was the key to the part for me is, you know, you read that script and he was the bad guy. Mm. And I said, oh, I know how to do this. Everybody else is going to play him like this sort of sleazy guy. And I said, no, you got to fall in love with this character. The audience needs to want to, him to be their friend so that they feel doubly betrayed. So I played him in a very sympathetic way. And the way I looked at it, that was just that he was a guy who was a really great guy, but who made one moral mistake and then had to constantly cover his tracks and, and did awful things. <laughs> we'll talk about Tony's new series, The Divide, when we get back. We're back with Tony Golan. He is also the executive producer and co-creator of WeTV's first original scripted series, The Divide. It premieres on July 16th. What is it about? How'd you get involved? Well, as you know, I, I had produced and directed this movie, Conviction. Which Great was, movie. Thank you. A true story about a case, uh, a man who was convicted, wrongfully convicted of a murder and spent 18 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit. And his sister had beca became a lawyer who was uneducated, became a lawyer to try and find a way to get him out. And um, Hillary Swank played that part, and Sam Rockwell played the brother. And he was great. Yeah, he was wonderful. And um, 
but the, the organization that helped her do this was the Innocence Project, which um, you know pioneered the use of DNA testing to exonerate. Barry Sheck and yeah, Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld. So um, anyway, I, after making that movie, I was fascinated with this world and wanted to support, shine a light on their efforts. And um, my friend, uh, the great writer Richard Lagravenes, and I had wanted to work together, and we started t talking about trying to find a television series in that world. So this. We decided to center it around a prosecutor who maybe gets it wrong, who made his career um, uh, uh, the first African-American DA of Philadelphia, uh, made his career on a highly charged uh, um, murder, a brutal murder where a black, wealthy black family was murdered by supposedly two white guys. He put them away. And we now meet them 12 years later where one of the guys is about to be executed. A young woman who's just out of law school, not even a lawyer yet, who works at our fictional Innocence Initiative, um, uncovers a piece of evidence that pulls a thread on this case. And that carries and through, the, carries whole through the whole season. And you find out, were they innocent? Were they guilty? Who did what? And we explore all of the gray areas in our justice system. How many weeks? We did eight episodes. Basically, what we're studying is the impact of a, of a violent crime on all the people uh, uh, surrounding it and um, the kind of issues and struggles and, you know, uh, because it's true. Every time, you know, a person does an unspeakable thing to another human being, <laughs> either someone gets put in jail if they're innocent, the guilty party got away, um, you know, it impacts the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, the victims, the families, all of it. You were on our friend Tavis Smiley show last mm -hmm. year, and you said how racial politics fascinates you. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, you know, I, I'm always fascinated by how much differentness between people, whether it's religious differences, racial differences, uh, uh, socioeconomic differences, divide us. Um, uh, the sort of predisposition to being uncomfortable with, with, our, with, with our otherness. And um, yet, I think we all have this innate goodness that wants to see our oneness and our sameness and our commun communal, you know, human experience, and we are far more the same than we are different. What I find fascinating now, and it's something we really explore in The Divide, you know, with President Obama's accession to, to power, to the White House, you know, it broke the mold. We are in supposedly a post-racial world, but people's um, racial prejudices and discomforts and anger and all of that, when that happens, when you make a big move forward, all of a sudden all of that ugliness in ourselves comes out as well. So one of the things The Divide explores is, you know, uh, one of our protagonists, the DA that I mentioned, played by the great Damon Gupton, um, you know, is determined as a politician to live in a post-racial world. His father, played by Clark Peters, if you remember him from The Wire or Treme, that's such a brilliant actor, who is the police commissioner of Philadelphia, you know, they are very much part of the power structure. He really sees, he came up in the civil rights era and sees it very differently, and we, um, it's just something we want to believe we're beyond, and we just are not, and it's important to talk about it. Doesn't it, it often does puzzle me almost all my life why pigment of skin should make a difference. Me too. I don't, too. I don't, I don't understand it. it. Just like religious differences. Yeah, I don't, I understand, don't it. understand it. We also have this innate fear impulse with that which is different from us, and I think that the solution to that, the antidote, is knowledge and familiarity. From president to prophet after this. <laughs>
mainstream Mormon church <laughs> wants nothing to do with them. And they have a community, you know, they're spread out over the country, but they have a community in, in southern Utah on the Arizona border called Colorado City. And um, they, you know, it's a very extreme fundamentalist form of Mormonism that, uh, you know, practices actively polygamy. And uh, they believe in a prophet that one of their, you know, members is speaks with the voice of God. As the Mormon and, church does. And, yes, absolutely right. But in, in this case, absolutely controls every facet of their lives. Um, and uh, it's a, from our perspective, it's a very bizarre uh, society. And, and Warren Jeffs, whose father was the prophet, um, pretty much seized, when his father died, control and became prophet, was the self-declared prophet, and took an already bizarre uh, uh, um, what we would perceive as a bizarre way of life and just took it to um, extremes, most specifically by marrying off girls of younger and younger ages and his youngest wife was 12 years old. He totally believed, didn't he? Or you know, do you think he was a charlatan? I think it's a fascinating <laughs> question. I think he convinced himself that he totally believed at the same time as I think he was a charlatan because I, I think that... Uh, you know, something that happens that we dramatize in the movie that's absolutely true is when Warren was arrested for rape uh, because there were... That's why he's made, doing life, right? He had made audio recordings of himself having sex with a 12-year-old girl, and he created these, what he called, sessions, uh, celestial sessions, he, he called them, where there was very ritualistic sexual sessions with these young women who were his wives, and... Um, it was all about speaking to God through sex, and um, there was a 12-year-old girl, and he uh, had already been arrested um, for statutory rape, and this, this sealed the deal. But when he went into prison, he um, confessed to his b b brother and, and another uh, person that he, that he was a false prophet, that he had lied, that he had sinned. Well, he it, was, it was yeah. because of the, the you know, weakness of his flesh, he had betrayed God, and then two weeks later, he had tried to commit suicide, and you know, two weeks later, he decided, no, that's not true, I really am the prophet, and he reassumed and still controls um, to the most minute degree uh, the from people's jail? lives from jail. How does he do that? Um, he, he has people come visit him, and he issues edicts. He writes constantly and records um, sermons and um, issues very specific edicts of what his followers can and cannot do, what they can eat, what they can wear, what they can, whom they can talk to, uh, who they can have sex with, how often they can have sex, who they can bear children with. Where is he in prison? In, um, he's in, in Utah, I think. So he was he, in prison in Texas. I can't remember if he's now in Texas or in Utah, but I think it's Utah. You, are you playing him? Yeah. Do you find something to like in him? No. Uh, so I, no, how, like how is, do you like avoid not the characterization? Right yeah, no, like is not the right word. Um, I found tremendous humanity in him and compassion for him, uh, you know, up to the point where he really went off the rails. Um, but look, we are all human and we are all flawed. And what was extreme in Warren Jeffs, uh, Baber, his addictions to power, control, sex, um, all of it, are impulses we all have that I can relate to as a human being and as a man. And so for me, it was fascinating to play into somebody who had felt deprived of power um, when his father was in, in, in the, on the throne, really, that once he took it for himself, he was a man who just had this tremendous, he was a narcissist. And I couldn't relate to that as a man, as a human being. So you just put yourself in those shoes um, and without judgment. It's not about like me or don't like me. It's like, this is the person I put myself in the shoes without judgment. Walk in the shoes. You appeared in one of the year's biggest hits, Divergent. Mm -hmm. right? You played the lead character of Trish's father. That's right. Uh, Shailene Woodley, right? Mm -hmm. What do you make of her? Oh, Shailene she's is, become enormous, right? She's, yeah, she's on the cover of Vanity Fair this month. She's extraordinary. She's 22, I think, and the most, A, she's a brilliant actress, but the most grounded, down-to-earth, lovely, unjaded uh, young actress I think I've ever met. The Virgin really was a big hit among mm -hmm. young people, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in the books, we're sold 
10 million copies? I can't remember, I, I may have the number wrong, but yeah, the Veronica Roth's series of three novels um, have just been, you know, I think two or three of them on the bestseller, top of the bestseller list at the same time. You, you touch success, don't you? I mean, look at it. Well, at the moment, Larry, I'm really grateful for it. You know, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years, and as you know, you know, you go through dry periods and periods of success, and you go up and down, and so uh, right now in a very fertile moment, so I'm trying to take advantage of it. It's not a science. <laughs> we find out which superpower Tony would like to have and more right after this. <laughs> Don't forget The Divide premieres on Wednesday, July 16th, and Warren Jeff's Outlaw Prophet, that will play June 28th, and that will be on Lifetime. And we have some social media questions for you. Great. Uh, at TJ Baker 167, how was playing Warren Jeffs different from other bad guy roles you've had? Well, why are you a bad guy? Like? Yeah, I, I think the answer to that question. I think the reason I'm a bad guy really was stemmed from Ghost. Um, and I think what worked about me being a bad guy was I didn't seem like a bad guy. As we discussed earlier, I wanted to play that guy as sympathetic as possible to make him most interesting. So, and I always approach bad guys like that, like where's the humanity? Um, so, uh, but the, the different thing about Warren Jeffs is he was a real person, is a real person still today <laughs> living in prison. And uh, so it, it was, uh, as I said earlier, I don't judge, it was very hard sometimes not to judge him because some of these things you'll see me do in the film were very difficult to do. Um, uh, the way he treats people and the sexual relationships with these young girls. And, um, but again, you can't judge as an actor. So you just put yourself in the situation and let the audience judge him. By the way, him. bad people don't look in the mirror and say, I'm bad. That's exactly <laughs> right. We all believe we're doing something for important reasons. Aaron Ebal, 29. Will you be directing any more episodes of Scandal? Yes, I'm going to be directing. I've done one this past year and the year before, and now in season four, I will direct, I think, the 11th episode. And Dam Hunt, what do you enjoy more, acting or directing? Um, the mix, if I had to, the best thing is both, to be able to do all of it. Um, the, the one makes me better with the other. If I had to choose, I suppose it would be directing, because you just you get control. to, you control, and you're the central storyteller, and you get to work with every single department. Play a little game of if you only knew. Just mm -hmm. play. Okay. Remember the first girl you ever kissed? Yes. Who was it? It was a game of spin the bottle when I was 10 years old. Where was it, at a party? It was at a, sort of a party, it was at my house, and my older brother had his friends over, and she was in seventh grade, and I was 10, and she was beautiful, and I was like, I'd never, and we were playing spin the bottle, and I was the young kid, and my brother let me sit in a circle, and this girl, you know, kissed me and lips like this, you know. <laughs> and I was like, following them around the whole night going, are we going to do that again? Are we going to play again? Are we going to play again? That was really good. Are we going to do that again? And my brother, I think, locked Remember me Remember your later. first audition? I do. I was in high school. I was a freshman in high school, and I auditioned for the high, first high school play, Inherit the Wind, and uh, my, only because my brother was playing the lead in it. And I sat down, and I read a scene with the theater teacher, and I was just like, oh, I know how to do this. Um, and was Which just, character? I remember it was intoxicating. He was one of the witnesses. His name was Howard. One of the young boy witnesses on the stand. Your brother played Daryl? Yeah, he played Daryl. And then I didn't get the part. <laughs> I, got, I, I had a one line in the show, but I was hooked. Drama, comedy, or thriller? Oh, gosh. All of it. All Musicals of it. or plays? Both. Which superpower would you like to have? Flight. Superhero you'd like to play? Mm. Wow. I think Batman. Who is most similar to their character on Scandal? I would say n n none of us, yeah. Best thing about playing the president? No matter what the situation is or the scene is, every time you walk into a room, you just have this power, this power, this aura, the way people deal with you. You, know, you bring so much to every scene just because you've got that title, Mr. They president. don't call you by your name. No, they don't, that's right. Yeah. Uh, what time period would you like to travel back to? I've always wished I could have been an actor in the 1940s. 
I haven't felt I was born too late for my oh, time. Oh, in the great the red great carpet. The great days of the theater. Robin the Taylor. Great, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not just Hollywood, that, but also when the Broadway theater, when there were hundreds of shows on Broadway. Death of the and, sales. Oh, my God, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Beatles or the Rolling Stones? Well, that's a tough one. I guess I have to say the Beatles, but I love both. Three things you'd take with you on a desert island. Uh, Beatles album, a Rolling Stones album, <laughs> and my wife. Most embarrassing moment on set? On set? Oh, my God. You ever crack up? Uh, yeah, all the time. Um, the most embarrassing moment on the set of Scandal probably was directing myself in a sex scene with Carrie Washington. Uh, and what do you <laughs> do? Running Stand around a naked what? and be like, okay, no, we gotta go again. <laughs> They, Marcel, the great Marcelo Mastrioni told me once mm -hmm. that the least turned on scenes to do are sex scenes. That's true. Because there's 80 people standing around Watching. and you got to figure all the way for camera angles. You never get turned on. It's so true. It's so true. <laughs> yeah. Um, biggest prankster on Scandal? Joshua Molina. Space travel or time travel? Mm, definitely time travel. Would you rather run 20 miles or swim 20 miles? Run 20 miles. Is there a subject or a project you'd love to develop into a film? I would love to do a film about um, the Oregon Trail, the pioneers. I'd love to be part of something to tell that story of, of um, the women and the people who, who were you know, Stage the, covered, the, the covered wagons of what that was. And an actor or actress you'd love to work with? Oh, so many. I have Samuel Streep. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Larry. Great to see you. I want to thank my guest, Tony Goldwyn. Make sure you watch him in Outlaw Prophet Warren Jeffs on June 28th, 8 p.m. on Lifetime. His new series, The Divide, premieres July 16th, 9 p.m. on WeTV. And you'll also see him this fall, Thursday nights, on ABC Scandal. Other than that, he has nothing to do. <laughs> and remember, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.